I'd like to tell you a story about Lewidget. And this kind of story spans the kind of full history of Lewidget, from like Lewidget 1.0 back in 2005, all the way through to Lewidget 2.1, B3, terrible number, but whatever, in the pr present day. And it's the, the kind of story of how Lewidget got from over there to over there. And mainly the, the kind of major change that has kind of happened through that time, which is kind of allowing you to use more memory, kind of as was kind of mentioned previously. So way back in 2005, most computers didn't have as much memory as they have currently. They kind of typically have less than four gigs of memory. Whereas today, like, even the phone in my pocket has like, more than four gigs of memory. Now, four gigs is a very kind of important threshold to cross. Because kind of back in 2005, most programs were 32-bit programs, which meant the, kind of ma the maximum memory that they could use was two to the 32 bytes, or four gig. And if you want to use more than that, you kind of have to leave this nice 32-bit world and enter the kind of big, scary 64-bit world. And Lewidget has done this, but it kind of took 12 years for Lewidget to move from one to the other kind of fully. And so like, Lewidget 1 was fast, but it was a 32-bit program. Lewidget 2.0 B1 was much faster, but still only a 32-bit program. By 2010, you could run Lewidget in a 64-bit program, but you had a memory limit on that. And then, like, that was the kind of state of affairs for like five years. And then 2015, you could use more memory, like full, no limit on memory, but you had to turn off the JIT compiler at the same time, which is like a bit of a trade-off. Like you can have more memory, but it'll be much slower. So, you know, if you wanted, it's there, but who would? And then kind of finally, like 2017, like, like 05, like recently, you could have like full memory in Lua JIT with the JIT then actually turned on. And like getting from all the way over there to over here is like a lot of challenges to get through. So I'm going to kind of try and tell you some of those. And this story of, of, of memory actually is very tightly linked to the story of how local variables work in LuaJet, which you know, might seem a little, little bit strange, but hopefully you'll kind of see why these two things are so closely linked. So let's start with local variables. They can hold a value of any type. And the Lua manual says there are eight types. Uh, I hope you all you know, aren't going to argue too much with that slide, although we'll see that it's kind of wrong. So eight types. There are eight locals, each with not the same type. You, know, you have like numbers, booleans, strings, functions, blah, blah, blah. Eight types. Life is good. Uh, except the manual said, the manual's kind of lying. There are really uh, nine types. There's this kind of weird type called light user data that you can program in Lua for, for years and never come across them. Or you can use a C API from like your first day and see them on your first day. They're kind of a way of taking a C pointer and kind of stuffing it into the Lua world and saying, you know, deal with that. Here's a pointer. Have fun. I mean, you can't then do much with them in, in, in Lua, but they, they kind of can go into Lua and they, they kind of sit there. And you can get them by you know, calling some weird functions. So that's like nine types so far, so good. But you know, LuaJet wants more than nine types. Like nine isn't enough for LuaJet. So for a start, it has this weird thing. Of rather than having like one Boolean type, it has separate types for true and false. And like, OK, that's kind of strange. But this is actually a really neat trick. Because uh, you'll often kind of be in Lua and say, OK, I'll say like, if x, then. And then you're kind of testing whether x is truthy or falsy for like a use of terms. But kind of falsy is nil and false, and truthy is any other value. So kind of if you split out Booleans to be separate types, then whether something is truthy or falsy is like entirely done at the type of types rather than having to look inside your types. And this makes your kind of ifs and your whiles like three times faster because you don't have to like look inside your values. So Logit does that because you know, it, it can for speed. But that's not enough for Lewis. Lewis wants more than nine types. You mean that uh, the type code itself tells you that it's true or false? Yeah. You yeah. There's an optimization. Yep. As uh, so with all of Lewis, it's there to make it faster. Uh, but yeah, that's Booleans. Even that's not enough for Lewis. It wants more types. Uh, there's this kind of weird C data type you get from any kind of FFI type thing. 
uh, which you know they're totally opaque to everything else that you get from them. There's also this type called prototypes, which kind of like functions, are like half of a function. I kind of won't go into too much deal about what they are. And like get, actually getting one in a local takes quite a bit of code. They're quite tricky to find. So that's uh, I've got like 12 types, uh, which I'd like to like that. That's it. That's all your types. But there are more. There are more. Logit has two more types uh, called up values and traces, which uh, you can have to take my word for it. They are types, they exist, but the amount of code it would take to actually find one is like more than a few lines. So trust me that they exist, they are types. And that's kind of Logit's type system is these 14 types. Uh, and we kind of group them into like the value like types up there and the object like, -like types here. If strings are kind of in the middle, like if you're using Lua, strings look like values. If you're writing LuaJet, strings look like objects. So they're kind of in between the two. Uh, I'm going to form the view of actually writing LuaJet, so I'm going to put them down here. And then I'm going to split out some of these value types to be singleton types, because they don't really have a value, they just have a type. At which point, you know, this is the LuaJet types in a kind of reasonable taxonomy. So they are kind of variably sized. They can be like any size. They have identity in tables. Uh, so like value types, you know, you put one into a table as a key. It's the same as any other one as a table, like any other one as a key. Like if you use tables as keys, like each individual table is a different key, even if they look like the same table. And you know, like if you pass them around, they are, you know, if they pass by reference-ish, if that kind of semantics makes sense. Whereas value types pass by value-ish. Uh, That's kind of what I'm... I'm surprised that you put uh, like user data as value types. Mm -hmm. But they behave like values, which I guess doesn't, doesn't answer your question. Uh, like if you do a push of an LUD with a given value, and then you push it again, they are the same thing. They are the same key in any table. And all LUDs same, share the same meta table. Like they don't have a per LUD table. They just have like one globally. Uh, they're you know, fixed size. They don't have any extra allocations. They really are value-like. Uh, so with that said, we have three value types. Sorry, three single types two value types and nine object types. And the question is, okay, how do we then r represent all of these types? What might a kind of local variable look like in order to have any of these things in it? And kind of the naive thing is say, okay, all local variables have a type, which we need like four bits of, of type because there are 14 types. Uh, and then you have at most one of either a number or a pointer to something, which is your LUDs or an object. Pointer. I know this would do. Like this is what Lua 5.1 does by default-ish. Uh, I know you could do this. It would be kind of okay. Uh, but if you do the math, this comes out to eight and a half bytes. That is, this guy is four bits or half a byte, and this guy is eight bytes. So eight and a half bytes. Except C won't let you have half bytes. It's like no, no, that, that, that's just silly. So it'll round up to nine bytes. And then it might even round up further. There are kind of good reasons to round up to either 12 or 16. But let's just say, you know, every local is nine bytes. And you can say this, and you know, it would, would work. But it would be much nicer to say, okay, eight and a half. Like, could we squeeze that down to eight rather than like rounding up to nine? Uh, and if, like, if there are two reasons why you might want to think that. One is, you know, nine is 12% more than eight. And who runs all of their programs using 12% more memory? Uh, the other reason, which is kind of far less obvious, is that 8-byte locals are three times faster to work with than 9-byte locals. And this kind of may surprise you. It's like, why such a big gap? Like, you know, 8 to 9? That's not that much. Like, why is it three times slower to be 9 bytes rather than 8? And to kind of show you why that's the case, we're going to have to delve down to kind of what your CPU can do. Uh, because that's kind of where you then realize why 8 is three times faster. So. Is that the same difference between 8 and 16? Uh, yeah, pretty much. It's the, the same argument. 
Well, you know, at 1816, you know, they're like twice the, the memory rather than 12% more memory. But yeah, 16 is still only like th three times slower than, than 8. Uh, so, what your CPU can do, uh, at least you know, if you have like some kind of Intel or AMD CPU in your pocket, which you don't because you have like, iPhones which aren't these, whatever. Let's assume that you know, your Intel CPUs, at which point you can execute billions of instructions per second, but each of those instructions has to be extremely simple. Each instruction has to look like one of these five formats. There's some operation that, that you're doing, and then two operands to that. And the operands can be registers or memory or 32-bit integers. And the, the operation could be like you know, equals like x equals y or plus equals and like x equals x plus three. And then there are like a thousand different things that your CPU can do, but like <laughs> let's not go into those. Uh, there is memory. You have like all the memory that you have in the world in your uh, computer. You also have registers, which are kind of like memory, but much faster and much smaller. Uh, so typically, like all of your programs, they like, will live in memory somewhere, and then you'll pull a bit of it into registers, work on it there, and then push the result back out to memory. Uh, and if you want to talk about memory, you can uh, within an instruction with one of these three forms. You can say, I have a particular a fixed address in memory that I will talk about. Or you can say, I will have some registers, I'll do some math on them to kind of figure out what address in memory I, I want to talk about. Or you can refer to the memory relative to where the instruction itself is. Uh, and as a kind of syntax note, we tend not to write things like this. We put the operation on the left as like a word rather than a symbol, and then with a, with a comma between the operands. So it kind of looked like mov x comma y rather than x equals y, and that's just how we write it for like tr tradition or something. Uh, so kind of high level-ish, low level-ish, that's kind of what your CPU can do, like hand wave, hand wave, believe me. Uh, so let's go back up to Lua land. Let's say you have two locals, x and y and you want to say x equals y. And you're going to want to think about, okay, what code does that become to your CPU? Uh, and that's going to say that all of your locals live in a big array, because they do. Uh, and you can have x and y given to you as indexes into this array. If your locals are all 8 bytes, x equals y is this code. You take your array, you add 8 times y, you load that into something, and then you store it into your local array plus 8 times x. So that's two instructions. Uh, if they were nine bytes, it would be these six instead. I'm like, uh, okay, why? I think, you know, just take this and replace these eights with nines and load into a nine byte thing rather than an eight byte thing. Uh, but your CPU can't do that. If you're doing kind of this you know, weird multiply thing, k has to be one, two, four, or eight. It can't be nine, so you can't do that. Ergo, you have to multiply by nine yourself separately, which is slower. And you say, you know, okay, let's just load into like a nine byte thing rather than an eight byte thing. Your CPU doesn't have any nine byte things to load into, so you have to load eight bytes and then load the ninth byte separately, and then store the eight bytes and then store the ninth byte separately. So, kind of, of course, your CPU kind of can't do stuff with nine bytes natively. It kind of takes three times more code to do nine bytes rather than eight. So, you know, that's a really strong reason as to why you want to be going towards eight if you want to make things fast. At which point, the question is, OK, how do we take all of the, these types and squish them down to 8? Like, you know, 9 is easy. 8 is kind of hard, but we'd really like to be there, because 8 is going to be much faster. And the answer actually lies within these doubles. But as Etienne kind of mentioned earlier, there's NAND packing going on behind the scenes, uh, which I kind of was thinking, like, how do you best explain what NAND packing is? Uh, I kind of, kind of the best I could come up with was, Let's have a look at some doubles. Uh, and let's have a table like this. So on the left, we have a 64-bit integer. And then if you take that integer, take the bit pattern of that, and then look at that same bit pattern as a double, you got the column on the right. And it so happens that the bit pattern for 0 as an int is the same as the bit pattern for 0 as a double. Like someone was like clearly on the ball when they were designing this. And you can just, like, go up, like the bit pattern that means 1 as an int is this like tiny double. And you can go up, and like 3.14 is like a double, and it's like that huge int. Uh, more interesting, if you go the other way, then uh, the bit pattern that means minus 1 as an int means nan, 
you know, nan is a thing, you need nan. Uh, oddly, minus two is also nan. Minus three is also nan. Uh, you go all the way down to minus four and a half quadrillion. I kid you not, quadrillion is like the actual term for that. Four, minus four and a half quadrillion, like it's still nan. Uh, it you know, then goes back to like, some actual numbers you probably care about, but like, there are these four and a half quadrillion bit patterns that all mean nan. Uh, and you're probably not going to immediately going to realize why four and a half quadrillion like, is such a natural number. Uh, but if you can kind of look at these in base 2 or base 16, you can kind of get to see the pattern of what's happening, which is if these 12 bits are all 1 and these 52 are all not 0, then it means nan. OK, we have like 2 to the power of 52 bit patterns that all mean nan. And the trick is to think, like, what if we could, re could repurpose these to not mean nan to mean something more useful? And could we, could we take all of the values that aren't numbers and kind of repurpose some of these nans to hold them? Uh, at which point you're going, okay, we have two to the 52 nans. Uh, we need to fit in three singleton types. That's three plus all the pointers. That's two to the 32 plus all of these guys, which is nine times two to the 32, which is like two to the 36. Plenty, you know, you can easily fit 2 to the 36 and then 2 to the 52. So you can kind of take all of your non-number types and just stick them in as nans. Which means local variables end up looking like this. You say a local variable is either a number or it's not a number. And if it's not a number, it has this like point v part and this type part. And the kind of type values are kind of chosen to be these negative numbers so as to coincide with the nan space. And it all kind of works out quite nicely. Like if you put anything that's not, not a nan in your double field, then your type won't be minus 1 through minus 13. And vice versa, if you put in any of these, and n is nan, it all kind of works out extremely nicely. And you get local variables being 8 bytes, which you know, makes me happy because it makes your CPU happy because it makes everything fast. And that's kind of roughly where LuaJet 2.0 B1 is. It's pulled all of these tricks, like nan packing, make it faster than LuaJet 1. Uh, and it has these kind of weird NAND packs. But it's still a 32-bit bit program. And the question is, how on earth do we get it to be a 64-bit program, given that we've you know, played these tricks to throw in all our pointer values through NANDs, and there aren't really enough NANDs to hold all 64-bit pointers? So if you kind of want to somehow do like the smallest amount of work possible to get like something running, as in somehow like embed LuaJet in a 64-bit program, but like with as many caveats as you can attach to it. Like what do you have to do to get there? So our light user data are a problem. Like they're now full C pointers, which means they're 64-bit pointers, which means that there are tons of them. Uh, which again, like it's really annoying because mo most people that write Lua won't realize that these things are even a type and they will have to be stuffed in here somehow. Uh, and then we have to deal with all of our object pointers, uh, but we can kind of cheat and say, like, well, we'll just like constrain them to the low part of memory, and you know apply this memory limit to all of LuaJet, which you know sucks, but it's like the easiest thing that you could possibly do, and like it'll get you somewhere. Uh, so obj object pointers are kind of easy. You just like say, let's have a memory limit. Is it on Mac? Uh, details, yeah. <laughs> Macs are annoying. iPhones are annoying. You can get around it on a Mac-ish, just kind of maybe. Uh, so yeah, like you can have these limits, but people will moan at you, like, why do you have these memory limits? Like, go away, we just have them, okay? Uh, but yeah, LUDs are a big problem. Uh, and again, like all you can do is cheat and say, well, most LUDs aren't 64 bits long, even if you're in that world. They're probably only 47 bits long if you're not in kernel mode, if you're not on Solaris, if you're not on a future Intel chip. Uh, but you know, apart from those, those cases, <laughs> most LEDs are going to be really, really 47 bits long. So you can say, well, let's just only support those. Uh, and again, people will moan at you saying, like, why can't I have bigger things? Like, well, tough. You just kind of have to kind of live with these things, which are like not quite what you want, but close enough. Uh, and kind of, if you can kind of say, okay, let's do both of these two things, then your local variables end up looking like this. I say, okay, it's either a number or it's not a number, 
or it's an LUD. And if it's an LUD, then it has this weird split of a 47-bit pointer and a 17-bit type, which is really kind of CPU unfriendly, but it you know, kind of just about works. And you have like this kind of three different kinds of thing rather than two different kinds of thing, uh, which you know, makes things less pretty, more complex. Uh, it also makes LuaJet slower. Like even if you never use LUDs anywhere, because you could, and because they ha it has to kind of work harder to allow them to be there, it makes cert certain things slower. So well, we want to look at the function called type. That is, it's a standard library for function. You give it a value of any type, and it'll give you a string containing that, that type of what you gave it. So in the 32-bit world, type is this code. Uh, it gets really quite pretty code, but you know, most people don't want to read assembly. So like, just go like, it's that long. Okay? In order to support LUDs, it has to become this long, which is you know, longer. And it has to like, do some bit shifts and loads and some other stuff. It's you know, annoying. So you know, just because LUDs could exist, even if you never actually use one, you can have paid this price like, around the place of slightly more complex code in order to support them. Uh, which you know, is sad, but whatever. So you know, we can solve these two problems, and then local variables can exist in a bigger world with slightly bigger pointers. Uh, of course, there are other things you have to do to move LuaJet to this uh, new world. First of all, LuaJet has two assemblers, like things that transform assembly code to machine code. Like it has two of them, like homegrown, handmade by Mike, and both of them need to be taught how to generate 64-bit code because it's like not quite the same as 32-bit code, and that's like a bunch of work there to like go through and make them function with th this new code. Uh, like some of the things of calling conventions, which are a pig, and stack layouts are a pig, and exceptions are a pig, because uh, they kind of all kind of relate to when we moved from the 32 bit world to a 64 bit world. People thought, well, you know, we're breaking stuff anyway. Let's like go and change a few other things, like how exceptions work, uh, which therefore like require you to figure out how they work in order to decompile stuff. Uh, this second point is kind of fun, is that in a 64 bit world, LuaJIT is a shared library. It'll live somewhere in memory. Your JIT compiled code lives somewhere in memory. And there's this kind of limit on how far away the JIT compiled code can be from the LuaJIT shared object. Like, that's kind of strange. Uh, uh, but again, that, that kind of comes down to what your CPU can do. Because you want your JIT compiled code to occasionally call back into the LuaJIT shared library. And again, can we go back to what your CPU can do? The shared library is in memory. Your JIT code is in memory, which means it has to kind of talk about where the LuaJIT is by one of these three forms. And basically, the only applicable form is this last one, which says take the address of your JIT code and add a 32 bit offset to it. And that kind of limits, because your offset can only be so big, the JIT code has to be close to the LuaJIT code. Which therefore, you need like, some tricks to make sure that you can allocate JIT compiled code close to your shared library. Uh, which you otherwise wouldn't have to do. Uh, and then there's some, like, some high, higher uh, level stuff, like you know, some new optimizations are now possible in this 64-bit world. Uh, some old ones you don't have to, to do anymore, like LuaJIT in the 32-bit world will kind of take 64-bit stuff that you ask it to do and kind of break it into two halves and do, do the two halves separately, uh, which it, like, it doesn't have to, to have to do that anymore because it can kind of do them natively in the 64-bit world. Uh, so you know, there's some stuff there to do, which you, know, you want to do. And after all of that, that stuff, you can get to 2010, where LuaJIT will exist in a 64-bit world. Like the kind of program that embeds LuaJIT can be a 64-bit program, but LuaJIT itself can't use very much memory. And that was 2010. You know, people moan. They're like, you know, we want more memory, like already. Uh, but like, it took five years before any anything happened. And kind of, it's an interesting question up here. Why was it like, OK to live in that world for, for five years with people moaning? Like, what changed in 2015 to kind of finally cause Mike to say, well, let's try and do something about this particular problem? Uh, and actually, the kind of cause of this was actually Apple and iPhones. And kind of Apple pushing for like, iPhones to be 64-bit and for all programs on iPhones to be 64-bit programs. Because uh, you know, Apple is strict like that. They have like rules. Uh, and they kind of also block off the low part of memory. So kind of previously, LuaJIT would say, OK, well, I'll exist in this world, and I'll use the low part of memory only. 
But then, you know, on OS X, kind of Apple blocked off this memory, but you could turn it back on with a flag. On iPhone, they block off the, this memory, and you literally can't use it. So kind of, you combine Apple saying you can't use the low part of memory, with your programs must be 64-bit programs, uh, and Apple also saying you can't have JIT compilers, but you know, details means, okay, well, something has to change in order to let Lua-JIT run on, on iPhones, which you know, people want it to, because you know, iPhones, games, games, Lua. Uh, games fast, Lua-JIT fast. So the question being, kind of, what do we need to change to get from 2010 to 2015? Uh, well, you know, you just take the same trick from LUDs of saying, okay, well, we'll have like a 47-bit pointer, which you know, kind of works, and like this 17-bit tag, which kind of works, and sort of do the same thing for LEDs, but for everything. And like, it's the same table with the same values here, with the same types. Uh, it's like, okay, you know, it works. It's really awkward. Like, your CPU doesn't like 17-bit values. Like, it can load 16 bits, it can load 32 bits. It really doesn't like 17 bits. You have to, like, load more and then shift off the bits you don't need. Uh, and because your CPU doesn't like it, again, kind of going back to this type function, like, you know, you had 32-bit world, 64 bit world, but cheating with LUDs only. And like the full 64-bit world, you know, it's about as much code as here. Like it's still like a lot of stuff and more complex than the old world. Uh, and like it gets full of bit shifts. Like it's really horrible. Uh, so again, like you can have more, more memory, larger pointers, but it comes like at a cost still. Like it makes Lurjet itself more co complex. Uh, and Actually, like it requires you have to rewrite all of the assembly code in Lurjet, which is like 4,000 lines of like assembly code per architecture, which you know previously was in the kind of fake 64 bit world. Like all 4,000 lines have to be redone to be in this newer world, which like a lot of assembly code have to go through and rewrite to make everything still work. Uh, like, I do not envy Mike for having to go through and rewrite 4,000 4, 4, 4, lines of assembly code. Uh, but there's, like, some other problem, which is actually a bigger problem. Like, you know, you can do this, and then, like, you think, okay, problem solved. All of my locals now can have larger pointers in them, and life is good. Uh, except there's this slightly awkward problem. So let's think about function calls. Let's say you have two functions, A and B, and that A is called B. And that we're kind of sitting inside of B and kind of looking at what the, the world is. So A has some locals, B has some locals. All of your locals live in one big array that's shared by all of your function calls. It's so like A's locals are over there, B's locals are over here. In this array, you know, 0 and 1 are A, 3 and 4 are B. There's this kind of weird slot in the middle. Uh, which is this odd thing done by Lurjet of in between every function call, there's like this pair of pointers. One of them is pointing to, to B, saying all the stuff over here is B. And one of them is going back to A, kind of into the middle of A to say, when you're done with B, go back to this point inside of A. And Lurjet needs these two pointers for every call. And it's like, well, you know, let's just put them in a local variable slot, because you know, in a 32-bit world, you can do that. You can take two pointers and stuff them into a 64-bit value, and it all kind of fits. Uh, but if you make your pointers bigger, you can't stuff two of them into one slot anymore. Like, they're just too big. Uh, so you have to say, OK, we'll have two slots of stuff between every function call, uh, which you think, OK, well, what's the big deal? Like, we just, you know, you used to have, like, one weird thing. Now you have two weird things. Like, sure, why not? Uh, but it gets rather more awkward. Let's say that Z was an argument rather than a local. And then you know, A passes value, which becomes Z. At which point, the code, the bytecode for A, will put like, text in the slot that B needs it to be in. So in a 64-bit world with like, full pointers, it has to put text into slot 4. Whereas for 1, it had to put it into slot 3. Which think, OK, like, sure, that's a you know, thing. Uh, but that means that like, the, the bytecode that you get when you compile Lua code has to change. Like, you can no longer take bytecode from one place and run it somewhere else, because like, it generates different bytecode in order to put your arguments kind of two slots up rather than one slot up, which kind of 
hurts the portability of compiled logic code, which is sad. Uh, it also is a right pain for the JIT compiler. Uh, there are like you know, three bugs in the first version of the JIT compiler for this stuff to do with this weird extra two slotness. Uh, so like, this is a real pain. Like, I'd like to like, like scream, like, this is a horrible thing to have to do. Like, it causes pain everywhere. Uh, and you really have to kind of almost trust me on that one. Uh, but you know, you do the, the, these things, and you can get to 2015. Uh, you know, local variables are like the only thing you, you have to solve. You'll say, let's just not do a JIT compiler. Uh, you know, if we're kind of hit here to do iPhone type stuff, and Apple won't let you run a JIT compiler, like, well, let's just not have it, you know, and just save the work. Uh, and you know, that's what Mike did. It's like, well, you can have larger pointers and run on iPhones, uh, but I, I just like won't port the, the JIT to this new world because you can't use it on iPhones anyway. Uh, of course, then you have to say, okay, what has to change in these kind of last two years to kind of get the JIT up to speed? And that's a separate challenge, uh, mainly to do with this guy, which is the IR instruction. And when, JIT, when Logit records your code to trace compile it, a trace is an array of these guys. Uh, and you'll note that this guy is, again, eight bytes long. It's a case of Mike going, well, I'll just take this thing that I need and like squish it down to eight to make it fast uh, and like deal with the consequences later. Uh, and again, it has a pointer field inside of it. So it's like, it's the same problem. It's like, okay, we've got like this pointer inside this structure. Like we could make the whole thing bigger, but that would make everything slower. Uh, so like, how do we make the pointer part bigger without making the whole thing bigger to make everything slower? Uh, and it's again, kind of a tricky problem to solve. Uh, to which you say, okay, well, let's just allow some instructions to be like twice as big. Not all of them. Like, don't make the whole structure bigger every time. Just say, like, those that need it can like have two slots in the array of instructions. So it's like everything in your array of instructions is either what it used to be, or it's then followed by a 64-bit value. And you know, you can do this. It kind of works. Uh, it again, you know, makes things more complex and therefore slower to work with. Makes Luajit itself even more complex to kind of figure out what's going on inside of Luajit. Uh, but you know, you can do it, and it kind of works. Uh, but that has some problems. Uh, I mean, you can no longer iterate through an array of these guys from like end to to, to start, because you no longer know whether something takes up one slot in the array or two slots in the array. So therefore, you can only kind of walk through your array of instructions forwards. Uh, which might seem like a kind of fairly, uh, like, you know, like, why would you care? Uh, but some optimizations that you want to do kind of naturally walk backwards through all of your instructions. So kind of those have to be reworked in order to only go forwards uh, ish. Uh, there's also this point that you don't want the IR to change during assembly phase, uh, which I guess won't mean anything to anyone. Uh, but let's see if I can make it mean something to some of you. Uh, so again, kind of going back to what your CPU can do, uh, there is no way of saying here is a 64-bit value like as part of an instruction. You can only say, okay, there's a 64-bit value in memory somewhere that I want you to use, and I kind of like refer to that value through one of these three forms. Uh, previously, you could kind of put your large 64-bit value in memory somewhere and like store a pointer to it. And you could put that small pointer into your IR, and life would be good. But because your pointers are larger, you can no longer say, I'm going to put my 64-bit value in memory somewhere and have a pointer to it, because your pointer is also as big as the value you want to kind of talk about. So you put the values in the IR like directly. But then you have to refer to the instruction itself, like to this part of the instruction, in the machine code that you generate. And therefore, you can't like, shuffle stuff around in your instruction array after you've started generating machine code, or kind of your, your pointers to these guys aren't going to be correct anymore. Uh, so that's kind of a bit of work that needs doing there. And there's like, some new stuff in the IR to let you load stuff from memory without having to have a pointer to it, because then like, you can't easily refer to pointers uh, in machine code. And you can do all of those things. I don't know, that gets you most of the way. Uh, but again, there's 
more stuff that needs doing. Yeah, more stuff. You know, this year and a half between no JIT, JIT and full JIT like takes a time to get through because there's just stuff you have to fix. Uh, also again, like the assembler that the JIT compiler uses has to be taught what to do with these new larger things, and like how to store and load locals. Uh, it also has to be taught how to hash pointers again, uh, which kind of raises an interesting point because the first version of the kind of new fancy JIT could have still had the old pointer hash. And you can actually get surprisingly far with using the wrong hash code for pointers, and it's kind of scary. It's like half your code still works, even though like, you're hashing things in totally the wrong way. Uh, and so like, it took a while to kind of notice that the, the new JIT still had the old, old hash in it. Uh, it needs to pull a bunch of tricks to handle higher memory pointers. Uh, like you want to kind of embed pointers into the code that you generate, kind of like to talk about things. But because those pointers are now larger, you can't refer to them in the obvious way. Uh, again, like when pointers were 32 two bits wide, you say, okay, is this object I, I have a certain pointer? Like you just put the pointer in here directly. Like you can't when the pointers are bigger. Uh, so you have to pull a bunch of tricks, kind of generate not the same code to do, to do the same thing. So that's a bunch of pain there. And there's kind of weird, like two slots in between every fu function call. You know, something like that is a bunch of pain. Like it makes your local variable stack no longer really a stack. Uh, and again, like lots of bugs were kind of in the first version of the new JIT, kind of based around, okay, your stack is no longer a stack, it has gaps in, like what's it in the gaps? The gaps are empty, but there are gaps, and like what are gaps? Like we're not used to there being gaps. Uh, so that's like a bunch of pain there. Uh, this is kind of final point around snapshots, which is like the opposite of the point above. So like snapshots are how LuaJIT says, okay, I'm in a trace, and I have to go back to the interpreter, like how do I save my state back into your locals? And because you could previously like, pack two pointers into one slot, you have to have like some extra stuff and say, you know, here's how to recreate the like other half of your slot, which you no longer have to do, which actually makes things simpler. Uh, but there are now like two different kinds of, of snapshot, and that's weird. But yeah, like you can do all of those things. And like we did, and then you can finally get to 2017 with all of those things fixed. And then you can actually have Lua JIT with the JIT with large pointers, and life is good. And that's where, where my story ends. Uh, like that, that's the, pre the present day. Like I don't know what the next chapter is, because the next chapter hasn't happened yet. Uh, and yeah, we're not quite sure who is going to make the next chapter, because Mike's only half a person now, and he's kind of stepped down. Uh, but yeah, we'll see. And that is kind of the end of our I will talk for now, and I will let you ask questions or abuse me or go like, what the hell were you talking about for the last hour? But it's still not the default. It's still not the default. Uh, if you use Raptor JIT, it will soon be the default. Once Luke's finished. Once Luke's finished. Yeah, I suspect Mike might make it the default with like a 2.1 final. Uh, Yes, it's kind of the big problem is that bytecode isn't compatible because I have to put things in separate slots, and therefore like it's not a transparent upgrade to go to it. Like people that have compiled bytecode can't then upgrade to 2.1 b3 with this mode turned on because their compiled stuff won't w work anymore. So that's kind of sad, and it kind of means that it won't be the default until at least 2.2. If 2.2 is ever a thing, I mean like Mike has weird uh, versions. Like all of Logit is, on, is in beta. Like it's all like 2.0.0, there is no 2.0.1, whatever, you know. It may be the, the default in, in the future, maybe. When you say the default isn't, so does that mean that there are two versions of the code? The like depending on the flag, you get old version versus. Yep. But like. That's one concern. Uh, like it's certainly not been measured uh, comprehensively. Uh, as it happens, Luke was saying today that actually GC64 is kind of faster in some things, which surprised me. Like I don't think it should be. I think it should be slower. But Luke says it's actually faster for some, some, some things. Uh, and yeah, like there are two versions of the code just like there's like a version for Intel and there's a version for ARM, 
like there's a third version for like Intel with large pointers. Uh, but it kind, of, you know, it kind of shares the kind of stuff with the kind of ARM with large pointers. Uh, so like it's kind of similar to some of the things which are already there. But yeah, so it's like a separate 4,000 lines of, uh, of uh, assembly code. A text editor. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I actually do. Uh, how do you step through code? Do you just mm -hmm. uh, how do you debug problems or step through stuff? Or? So it may surprise you, but I actually like Windows, uh, and I like doing C development on Windows uh, because Visual Studio is like a great tool for doing C code and for debugging C code. Uh, Yeah, and like you know, you can kind of step through and debug things nicely. Uh, and I have like a build of Luajet personally that will build inside of Visual Studio as like a proper VS pro project. Uh, so like my go-to thing will be okay. Someone's like said there's this bug in Luajet. I'm like, well, okay, can I reproduce it on my Mac because that's probably where they found the problem. Okay, yes. Can I then also re reproduce it on my Windows box because I prefer to debug things there because the debugging tools are nicer. Uh, but yeah, that's kind of. Like, it's a normal C program from my point of view, all of it with like lots of assembler in there, but that's at the kind of level that I'm happy with, so. But presumably Visual Studio can't show you the actual source code sometimes, right? Because there's a lot of generated stuff, isn't there? Uh, yeah, I mean, the interpreter for Fluidit is written in uh, assembly, and is then like compiled to a less friendly assembly. And VS can only show you that kind of compiled form. Uh, and yes, if you JIT compile code, you can only see the kind of compiled form of that. You have to kind of work backwards to see what the kind of IR was or what the bytecode was. Uh, I mean, there it's like you use the normal flags that Luget has to dump your code, like the you know, J dump equals bit MSRX to say you know just dump everything, and you know I'll work with it somehow. Uh, Again, I, th I think Luke is building some very nice tools for kind of debugging what Luja does, uh, but that kind of you know work in progress and uh, weirdness. is you have to be happy to read and write assembly code for several different CPUs, uh, which is... It's quite a big challenge. Yeah, like and that alone, like... Trying to do it for one CPU yeah. is complicated. So yeah, so doing it for just one CPU is, is hard. Doing it for like five is really tricky, which again is like, is part of why Luke was like, okay, my Luajit that I'm forking is like only going to have one type of CPU that it supports. Uh, which you know, I think is actually a good thing to do for Luke to kind of play around. Because, uh, you know, the, the number of people that kind of know enough to work on Luget on every architecture, like, I'm not in that group. Like, ARM stuff is like outside of what I know, MIP stuff is outside of what, what I know. So, like, there are very few people that kind of know enough to actually understand all of Luget. And therefore, it's like, the view is like, okay, well, like, why make it easy for them? Like, there are like five people anyway that this could apply to. Like, why bother writing a how to guide for five people? Uh, which, you know, isn't a great philosophy, but you know, it's like the one that people have. Uh, and yes, like, if you want to get, get into it, like, you know, focus on one CPU. So, like, in my case, you know, 
I will care about Intel CPUs and not, not about ARM CPUs, and I can like, kind of ignore all the, the ARM, <coughs> ARM stuff. And it's, you know, be prepared that like, half of the logic interpreter is in assembly. Like, kind of, when you kind of first look at it, it's like, okay, you know, I know that, that Lua can do stuff. Like, where is that stuff inside of LuaJet? Like, you'll search all, all the, of, the, of the C code, and you're like, hey, like, the stuff that should be here isn't here. Like, where is it? Like, aha, it's in the assembly files. Oh, God, it's in the assembly files. Uh, so, you know, like, knowing that there is this chunk of assembly code that you have to go and look at. Uh, I mean, yes, yeah, so there's no kind of nice, gentle intro of, of saying, like, you know, first look at this thing, and now look at this other thing that's larger. Uh, again, like, you can kind of ignore the, the JIT to start with. It's like, you know, the JIT's off in that corner, and I'll just, like, not look at it too much. And, like, you can then learn what the interpreter does and, like, add the JIT later, which is probably a, a good way of starting. Uh, Again, I think it's. Yeah, I think it is actually good to go through the normal Lua code, and then like you'll see how up values work, how prototypes work, how bytecode works, and like you'll see like the genesis of LuaJet, and like a bunch of things that still apply. And yes, it'll be in a much kind of clearer form. You'll see, you know. There are locals, there's a garbage collector, you have prototypes, you have functions, you have tables, and they're all kind of done like this. And then, in most cases, the LuaJet version is just like a slightly evolved version of, of that. Well, evolved and faster and more complex. So, yes, it can really help us kind of see the simpler version first. And, uh, you mentioned the Raptor JIT project. So, they, they, they have a desire to like see interpreter, right? For LuaJet. Is that possible? I wasn't aware that they were planning that. It surprises me. Yeah, because I think uh, there's an issue of an attack. I think uh, Luke, 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 how do you pronounce his name? Luke, Gorry. There ought to be a maintainable version of the C interpreter, of the interpreter. Yeah, like I can see because that. Because you can obviously prototype stuff more quickly. Yeah. But my question is, is that even doable? Uh, yes. Yes, it's doable. There is actually a C preprocessor for logic, so you can basically include the same pedal files from C and code and from logic using do define and other stuff. It's very convenient if you want to reprocess that to start with the UI and C. Yeah, but Luke wants to prototype the byte codes that Logit runs, because uh, Luke is crazy. Uh, and he wants to write like network switching stuff at line rate in Lua, in LuaJet, which is a crazy plan. Like I'm surprised that it actually works, but it does somehow. I know that there are like other projects with the fun of like shifting Lua, so not not making uh, LuaJet and C, but just like another implementation that is just that that is in C. So um, I can see so that. No, But so are there it's any? Like, would the so pub be a better venue for your okay, questions? Okay, okay. So, you know, I mean, one of the things I've been looking at is how can we make it more faster, right? And it just seems impossible to hit the logic's kind of speed. You, and I'm just talking the interpreter. So, what, in your view, since you know it quite well, what's in your view key? reason for the interpreter speed. Interpreter of LuaJet is like twice as fast. Mm -hmm. And you can do lots of optimizations on the Lua side, interpreter side. And I've tried a few, but there's no way you hit that improvement. Yep. What in your view, is there a single thing or is there a combination of things? So is there one thing that we could do that would <laughs> tremendously help Lua's performance? I suspect the answer is write the interpreter in assembly, which is not a useful <laughs> answer. Uh, oh, is that, but there must be a reason for that. Is that because you can do jumps more efficiently? Which is, branching is much more efficient. C compilers are notoriously bad at compiling like 4,000 line functions, and they're compiling large switches inside of loops. And an interpreter is 4,000 lines of large switch statement inside of loop. 
uh, like doing the register allocation for this is like really tricky. Uh, so you know, your compiler will do like an, an okay job, but if you like spend like days studying like how to allocate things into registers at separate times, you can like beat the compiler by a lot. Lord, what you're saying really is there's no way. No, it's as if you should spend your time improving the compiler, <laughs> compiler and then you'll get it for free. <laughs> yeah, but if, no, if that was easy, people would have done, done that one. Yeah, but, yes. you, <laughs> but, but lots of people really don't target that problem as being a particular thing to optimize the compiler. Yeah. Like, because it's quite a specialist problem. Yeah. And most people solve it by using a compiler, <laughs> not, not yeah. by <laughs> compiling a version of Zip. Yeah, of course. Sorry. That's, that's the JIT option, but I'm thinking. Well, no, but you could, you could really try and optimize that code. Yeah. You know, yeah. There's a question at the back somewhere. Would it be possible to use esoteric parts like TCAM memory, so content personal memory, or FPG to sort of like do that as a platform? To run Lua code? Yeah. I mean, I would. Like I'd like to see Lua on an FPGA, just like for like points of like cool, yeah. uh, but like I don't see it as a particularly useful thing to do. Uh, like if you're on an FPGA, you are like counting your cycles. So like you know, my code has to run in like ten cycles in order to actually run. Which for like any kind of language other than like FPGA gates and stuff, like isn't gonna be useful. <laughs> yeah. 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 Like my only answer is like you know FPJs are great. But if we're kind of doing lots of computation, then it's probably cheaper to cross the, P the PCI bus and then like do your computation on a CPU at a much higher clock rate than your FPGA. Yeah, yeah but you know you can cross the PCI bus within a few hundred n nanos, and sure you can do FPGA computation in that time that's useful. But Yeah, so when you JIT your code, everything is type specialized. Uh, like every value is given a strict type, and it has to be that type. Uh, and like. But like, I meant in, in terms of like visually dynamic language, even if when they are JITed, they still have like type checking. Like, especially for example, when you add two numbers, you usually want to check if they are all like. Two values, and you don't know what they are, and like the class operator is overloaded with types. Then, in like a man type check, like type to the irritation in that way. Yep. Then you remove the the type, like the type checking at every direction of the chain. Yep. Operation. Yep. Logit does all of that, uh, and then again, yeah, because true and false are separate types. And because all branches are kind of done on truthiness and falsiness, if you've done type specialization, you get control flow specialization for free, uh, which is kind of nice because Logit wants both. Like traces can't have control flow in them. Uh, so kind of wants nice spe specialized control flow, which you get for free if you specialize to types. <laughs> 